Hi there. My name is Allison Meyer. I am a former high school social studies teacher who taught primarily in highly impacted schools from Chicago to Denver. Since leaving the classroom, I've had the incredible opportunity to learn about restorative justice practices from leaders of this work across our country. For many years, I served as the project manager of the Restorative Justice Partnership, a collaboration between Denver Public Schools, the Denver Classroom Teachers Association, the Denver-based community organization Padres y Jóvenes Unidos, Colorado Education Association, and National Partners Advancement Project, and the National Education Association. This groundbreaking collective of education stakeholders had a simple focus. How do we implement high quality restorative practices in schools? And how do we share our learnings with others? Since then, I've served as the district coordinator of restorative practices for both Denver and Jeffco public schools. So it is with those experiences and an immense amount of help from mentors along the way that I facilitate this learning today. In this video, we'll be discussing restorative justice practices in the age of coronavirus. As our schools are constantly adapting to new health precautions and our communities are grieving losses of loved ones, of jobs, of traditions, of mental well being, it is important, as important now as it has ever been to have schools be centers for connection and healing. Let us begin by grounding ourselves in how restorative justice practices serve as tiered supports for our students and their educators. How do the five R's or the five values of restorative justice practices contribute to cultivating belonging? Check out the base of our pyramid, the foundation of our community. If our community has healthy relationships, mutual respect, and shared responsibility, conflicts will still happen, but not as often, and they will be easier to resolve. When we feel connected to a community, we are less likely to intentionally cause harm to one another, and more likely to be kind, respectful, supportive, and collaborative. And we know that these conditions are essential for both belonging and for learning. The more formal restorative practices that we might use to build these first three R's are restorative language and community building circles. However, there are plenty of other strategies that I can use, particularly in these times when I'm not always able to have organic conversations the way I used to be able to. We know, however, that conflicts will still happen because we are human beings and conflict is a natural part of the human experience. When we do have conflicts, our goal should be to repair the relationships that have been impacted and the harm that was caused to the best of our ability. And that person repairing the harm may need some support. We can use the targeted interventions or responsive practices of restorative conversations, formal conferencing, and harm circles to recognize the harm that was caused and create a plan for repairing it. These practices, with a little creativity, can still function in a virtual world. Our last R and the top of our pyramid is reintegration. After someone has repaired the harm that they have caused and has even just been, or has even just been absent from our community, they should be reintegrated or welcomed back. And they may, may need some help as well. I think of our reintegration practices as intensive interventions. And we can continue to help folks reconnect to a community that they have lost connection with, even if that community exists outside of the four walls of a school and in a combination of physical and virtual worlds. So let's explore how we can adapt some of our practices so that we are still upholding the five R's, even as school looks very different these days. We're going to start with the foundation of caring communities. How do we build the meaningful relationships, mutual respect, and shared responsibility that we know is integral to positive school and classroom culture during COVID times? There are certainly some unique obstacles that we are facing at the moment. Health precautions, while necessary for keeping us safe, can be inhibitive for creating community. We have to keep physical distance between one another. Our faces, and hence much of our nonverbal communication, are hidden under masks. 
Many schools have directives about how long you are able to even be in the same room as someone who is part of another cohort. Additionally, we are frequently seeing individuals having to isolate themselves from the little human contact they have for mandated quarantines once exposed to the virus. Additionally, educators have to be in the, the enforcers of those health precautions, and that is heavily grounded in compliance, and it might complicate it, our ability to be restorative in the way that we approach students who are not meeting expectations. Some school leaders have observed a growing tension between students who are remote learners and students who are in-person learners. Remote learners might feel like their learning is an afterthought, that the lessons are designed for the in-person students and barely adapted to meet their needs. In-person students might feel frustrated when they have to ask permission to use the restroom as they can see their virtual classmates sipping on beverages that wouldn't be allowed in the classroom and turning off their cameras as they need when they'd like to take a break. Those same tensions are probably emerging between remote staff and in-person staff, especially if we recognize that many staff were not able to get the assignment that felt best for their health. All of these factors, in addition to the losses that we are experiencing in our personal lives and the constant reminder of the inequities that exist in our society are leading to elevated stress and anxiety. There is less time and folks might have less capacity for intentional community building. Concerns about students falling behind academically might also be shifting priorities away from creating community. So this is the reality that educators are faced with right now. And while it is complex and nuanced, it is not a death sentence for proactive restorative justice practices. This season of human existence has required an immense amount of flexibility, understanding, and creativity. And I have observed some incredible adults and students come up with creative ways to feel connected to one another. Here are a couple of my favorites. When we think about fostering community, one aspect of that is building student to adult connections. Some great options for these individual relationships are two-way journaling. Maybe the students respond to a check-in question and then the adult writes back a validation and a follow-up question. And this helps recreate those casual individual check-ins that we are missing out on this year. We also want to make certain that we are communicating with students beyond email and honestly beyond any form of written communication. The written word can be misinterpreted and we can miss important aspects of what a person is trying to communicate with us. So we should normalize one-on-one -on -one phone or Zoom conversation with students who are virtual. Try a home visit, talk with family, meet in a park outside and physically distant. Use those one-on-one -on -one chats to elevate strengths and show appreciation for that young person and their family and everything it is that they are going through right now. And you should be using those exact same practices with your colleagues because we know those adult-to-adult -adult connections are so important for our personal well-being. We also want to ensure that we are building relationships amongst students or amongst staff. Host social hours on Zoom. In our schools, I know educators are asked to not eat lunch with one another as it impacts who needs to be quarantined if there is a COVID case. But that doesn't mean that we, can, that we can't be in our own classrooms and logged into Zoom to laugh about our day so far while we eat our lunch. In my office, we host monthly social hours after work on Zoom and take turns facilitating community building games. I know teachers are hosting lunch bunches for their remote learning learners or having kiddos log on when the school is temporarily closed for a cleaning just to play a game with one another and have some unstructured time to be silly. We can also cultivate joy by playing some icebreakers. There are plenty that can be adapted to a virtual or even a hybrid setting. One I've been playing, I call three things. One virtual participant turns off their camera, changes three things about themselves or their background, and the rest of the group has to deliberate and guess what's changed. Another is called Silent Singer. A virtual participant mutes themselves and sings a song. Others in person and online try to guess what song they are singing by reading their lips. When you think you've got it, you start to sing along. These are sure to get some laughs and cultivate joy as we work through these really strange times.
Make sure you are also soliciting feedback from your students or the adults that you work with to hear what they need. And especially make sure you're hearing from those that have been communicating through their behavior that they are not feeling connected this year. Additionally, we do not have to abandon the practices that we know worked well before, like community building circles. Rather, we can adapt them to follow health precautions and navigate the virtual and hybrid worlds. When facilitating in-person circles, I have found that the adjustments I've had to make are much more minimal than I initially had built them up to be in my head. Instead of a talking piece, which kind of feels like a germ magnet these days, I've had students pantomime one. Sometimes they'll even let me know what the object is, a, an important stuffed animal, uh, a fragile piece of ceramics, so that we can treat it with the appropriate amount of care. It doesn't have to be that complicated. If we're doing a standing circle, the participant whose turn it is to speak can simply, simply take one step forward and then step back when they are finished. We can also move outside where students and adults alike can then take a mass break. I've turned a circle prompt into a walk and talk. Students buddy up and take a lap around the track or the parking lot. And by the time they come back, they've both answered the prompt and can fill me in on what they've learned about each other. Moving outside can also help with the projection challenges that masks create. And if outside is still not very quiet and it's hard to hear folks, you can always navigate this by having students respond in small groups. Maybe I share the prompt and then students create pods of four and then that's where they share their answers. I also love adding a community building prompt as the first step of collaborative learning. So before you dive into those math problems, whether you're in a breakout room on Zoom, or you're working with the person sitting next to you in person, everyone shares a book that they read that was particularly impactful. Similarly, as I've gotten more familiar with virtual leading, meetings and the different tech platforms that are available, I have found ways to host meaningful virtual circles. I've learned to post the questions and the order will be responding to the question in into the chat. I've seen folks make visual representations of circles using the Zoom whiteboard feature or a Jamboard or a Word document that is shared. For a multi-round circle, I'll mix up the style of responses since I know it can be harder to engage virtually. We'll do one prompt as a visual response. Fist to five, how are you feeling? And students can hold up a different number. Or I'll do a would you rather. And if you pick the first answer, you're giving me jazz hands. And if you pick the second one, you're putting your index finger on your nose. The next prompt will respond out loud and take turns hearing each one another's voices. And then maybe the final prompt when we're checking out, we'll do that in the chat. One word, describe how it is that you're feeling. I've learned to lean on some amazing tech tools that I've learned about throughout this time as well. Check out Flipgrid. Students can pre-record their answers to a prompt, and then we can play the video compilation of all of their responses. Students can also interact with one another on it there, ask each other follow-up questions, like each other's responses. One thing to be mindful of when you're facilitating those virtual circles is how folks use the chat. Frequently, when I set guidelines, I remind folks that our goal is to listen without reacting. So we shouldn't be using the chat, whether that's to ask follow-up questions, um, to say, me too, I agree. Um, we shouldn't be using the chat unless we need immediate support or if we were prompted to respond in the chat. And that way we can make sure we are honoring whoever is sharing their perspective at that time. Most complicated has been navigating the hybrid environment when I may have some folks participating in person and some folks participating virtually. Often educators express that it just feels clunky and unnatural when facilitating a hybrid circle. And so here are some creative solutions that I have used or I've seen others use. First, training student circle leaders, which is always a great strategy, COVID times or not, but can be especially helpful in that hybrid environment. That way you could have one student who is virtual and trained to facilitate, and possibly one or more students in person who are trained to facilitate, and then adults will just be able to choose which one they are attending, most likely alternating so that they are ensuring they're building good relationships with both groups of students. However, we know we also wanna build connections between our remote and our in-person learners. 
right? So one option would be to have all of your in-person learners log into their laptops now that so many of our schools have one-to-one -one technology. You have to navigate a couple things sound-wise to make sure you don't get too much feedback, but at least then every kid's face is seen in their own box. We can also use those same small group strategies that I mentioned before, or we could use Flipgrid for asynchronous responses that then can then be shared all together. We can clearly post the order of our circle to make sure that students attending virtually are peppered into the students that are, are participating in person. Occasionally, I'll use written responses as well. Maybe everybody responds on a table in a Google document. Or maybe the in-person students respond and put a sticky note on their desk, and remote students respond in the chat. And then I can find ways to grab a sticky note off of the student's desk and pepper in those responses throughout the class period, or refer back to what a student has shared in the chat. These tips and tricks can help us keep circles on a variety of topics. But I should mention that we can and we should also be using circles as a tool to process how COVID is shaping our lives right now. Rarely do we have such a broadly shared experience in our communities. There is so much that we can talk about as a classroom, as a school, or as a staff community. Here are some examples of circle prompts that I've seen foster community in our classrooms and staff lounges that are specifically related to COVID. What is something you've lost this year and what is something you've gained? The prompts are simple, but they honor the complexity of what this past year has been like for so many people. What is something that you are more appreciative now because of COVID? I'll also use circles to talk about the health precautions that we are all having to abide by and that adults are having to enforce. This might sound like, what is something you worry will get in the way of you practicing physical distancing? I've also used prompts like, what is a support that you need to be better at wearing your mask? Or what is one reason that you think it is important to wear your mask? The coronavirus and its fallout are also shaping the politics of our country. What an amazing opportunity to hear from young people on those topics. I've seen a couple of articles um, and Instagram posts of educators leading circles similar to this one. There are many articles being written about students being behind academically because of COVID. What is something you want those authors to know? In a time when students are feeling like they have very little control over what school looks like, what is an amazing opportunity to elevate their voices and hear how they feel about the assumptions that adults are making about their well being? We can also adapt our responsive practices to continue to hold students accountable and support them as they work through conflicts and learn new behaviors. In addition, this time is ripe with transitions, conditions are constantly changing, and we can use our reintegration tools to help students navigate that. There are some obvious challenges in utilizing responsive practices as well. First, many schools have seen a rapid decrease in their most common attention-seeking behaviors. Rather, students are exhibiting behaviors that are more internalized, that have a larger impact on themselves than being disruptive to the classroom community. This might look like attendance concerns or disengagement. Students might be isolating themselves and coping in unhealthy ways. It can be harder to follow up with students on behavior when they aren't in person or when they aren't in person every day. We've also got some new behaviors popping up like Zoom bombing or inappropriate use of online discussion boards that maybe we don't feel as equipped to respond to the first time we ever see them happen. And again, the uncertainty of this time is leading to elevated stress and anxiety, which certainly contributes to conflict. But just as with our proactive practices, most of our responsive practices can be adapted to fit this new world that we are operating in. I think I was most nervous about redirections um, during this time. Individual redirects are most effective when they are given privately. And then there are masks and six feet reels and online platforms that are going to make that very difficult. I've seen teachers navigate this, however, with grace and flexibility. In Zoom, I'll frequently use a breakout room to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a student. 
I can also send them a private chat, but I try to be mindful that tone is not always communicated very well on virtual platforms. I can be clear and consistent in our expectations and how those translate to virtual spaces. If our expectation is in person is to respect who is speaking, how does that apply to the chat function on a Zoom call? Being extra explicit about these can be very helpful in supporting students in meeting expectations. I can also let students know how they can expect me to respond to some of these new behaviors. For example, I might say, please note that any inappropriate posts will be removed immediately from our online learning platform. I will then follow up with the student who posted and any who commented to talk about how we can repair any harm that may have been caused as a result of the post. Then I can update students as I learn more about this behavior and develop new intervention strategies. When a redirect isn't enough and we need to have a restorative conversation, I will be grateful to pass Allison if she's already set up a system where it is normal for students and I to check in one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom and Google Meet. I can work this behavior reflection into our normal check-in time. I can give students the questions in advance to reflect upon so that they feel more prepared. There are still plenty of ways that students can repair harm in a virtual classroom, perhaps by being our chat moderator or leading us in a community building activity. When the behavior and conflicts are even bigger and require a formal conference or a harm circle, I might assess the situation to see if it's more appropriate for an in-person or a remote practice. This might depend on comfortability of the participants, or it might be that I would like to see faces, so we're gonna go the virtual route so we can be unmasked. I can be transparent with expectations, like how to signal that we're going to take a break. Turning your camera off, by the way, is my favorite way to do so. Or guidelines for how we'll navigate tech. We're going to have cameras on. We are committing to not recording. We will only use the chat function when we are prompted to. We will only have the Zoom window open on our screens. We can use breakout rooms and waiting rooms so folks don't have to be uncomfortable before our process has begun and throughout any breaks that we may take. I've also learned that I need to be more intentional about scheduling follow-up as I'm less likely to just run into that kiddo or that adult in the hallway. I also have to be honest with myself and recognize my limitations as a facilitator. I, for example, cannot read body language in the same way via Zoom. And if I'm aware of that, I can navigate that limitation as I gauge the appropriateness of a conflict for a conference. This year, learning has taken many forms and often rapidly transitioned between those modes of learning. We can use circles to support our students in navigating those transitions and reintegrating into whatever community it is that we're creating in that moment. Whether a cohort of students is going into a two week quarantine or returning from a two week quarantine, or if our entire district has to put a pause on in-person instruction, this circle has been so helpful for processing together. How are you feeling about the transition to in-person learning? Second round, what is one thing you'll miss about being remote? What is one thing you worry about as we move into in-person learning? What is one thing you are looking forward to now that we're in person? And is there anything adults or peers could do to make this transition easier for you? Such a lovely way to acknowledge all of the feelings that might be coming up for students and staff alike every time we have one of these transitions. COVID has created an environment in education where we often have to be reactive. We may only find out the night before that we are switching to a completely new way of learning and schedules have to be overhauled. The reality is that eventually, as vaccines are distributed and herd immunity is developed, health restrictions will relax and students and staff will return to more normal ways of existing at school. As things reopen, we need to be intentional about what we go back to. Normal wasn't working for everyone. With the amount of new systems and structures that we have put in place, there are bound to be some that we should keep in some form or another, even in a post-COVID classroom.
Being restorative means constantly reflecting on our practices and the impact they have on our community. You might use these next couple months to reflect with staff, students, and families about what parts of the way things were are actually worth returning to and what parts are not. With schools I partner with, we've been using these questions to reflect and plan for future years. I'll often start by listing the, having folks list the positive shifts in mindset that we've seen during COVID times. Increased flexibility, empathy and understanding for the challenges that folks are experiencing outside of school. Not blaming adults or students when they're having a rough day. Renewed partnership between schools and caregivers. These are some of the responses I've heard folks share. We then brainstorm what each of us can do in our roles to sustain these mindset shifts post COVID. We honor the challenges we know we will experience as students return full time and COVID restrictions are relaxed. And then we plan. If we are worried that students will struggle to return to a very structured school day, what supports can we put in place to make that transition easier? Lastly, we look at the written and unwritten practices that we've put in place for COVID and reflect on which are worth keeping in some form or another. Here are some responses I've heard to COVID practices worth keeping. The first one is one I think about often. As much as this was a logistical nightmare for many schools at the beginning of COVID, we now have a process for students to be symptom screened upon entry to the building. And what this means is that every single student is greeted by a trusted adult when they arrive at school each day. So many of our schools have found that these one-on-one -on -one check ins strengthen relationships and allow for adult, early adult intervention when a kiddo is having a hard time or needs some additional support. I know many educators problem solving how we can continue this system of adults greeting students even when we no longer need symptom screening. At the beginning of this school year, I watched educators clearly articulate COVID health-related expectations to students and their families. Many buildings did intentional orientations so that students could practice in small groups. There were careful, was careful explanation about why each expectation existed. And for the most part, our schools have had very little pushback in following these expectations. Another example of a practice worth keeping. How can we be this intentional with onboarding students to all of our school-wide expectations? To navigate limitations on group gatherings, we've seen schools implement staggered dismissals. And then they found that they reduce the number of after-school conflicts. How can we maintain this in some form post-COVID? Same with more structured lunch routines or different stations at recess. I've seen schools who may need to remove a student for safety reasons for a day to ensure that they are ensure that they are still provided access to learning. They're taking advantage of the remote classrooms. How can we ensure that all students have this moving forward while also being mindful that we don't use the excuse of they still have access to remote learning as a reason to not alter some of our punitive practices? We've seen increased involvement of caregivers in a child's education as circumstances brought schools into our homes. We've seen teachers more open to folks popping into Zoom classrooms than they may have been in a physical classroom. I've noticed an increased appreciation for the importance of relationship building. Let's not forget about these amazing transformations as we move out of COVID. Through the ups and downs of this past year of COVID, I frequently reminded myself that restorative is not just a spectrum of practices, but rather it is a way of being. When I think of being restorative in that way, I am able to be much more creative in how I can uphold the five R's, even when I cannot be physically present or physically near to the peoples and communities that I operate in. Thank you for your continued thoughtfulness. I'm looking forward to future hugs and handshakes.